This is another video about 1.1.2 about greatest common divisors in Stein's Elementary Number Theory book. So we're here at lemma 1.1.7, 1.117 is what that says, sorry. <laughs> it says that for any integers a, b, and n, the GCD of a, n times b, n should be the same thing as the GCD of a, b times the absolute value of n. So in particular, what you'd like to be able to do is to factor this n outside. We're saying, sure, just make sure it's the absolute value of n. Okay. So uh, maybe this is kind of like a, a neat proof that uses induction in a way that we might, might not be uh, too familiar with, say. But what we'll try to do is just use Euclid's algorithm from the previous video, or the Euclidean algorithm, that was a way to compute the GCD of two numbers. And what we'll do is we'll multiply it through by n later on. So for simplicity, I know it says for all a, b, and n. Well, let's just show the case whenever a and b are both positive numbers. So what we'll do is try to show that this equality happens. We'll do induction on the sum a plus b. Now, um, if a and b are both positive numbers, then a plus b has to be at least 2. right? If they're both positive, then a plus b has got to be at least 2. So that'll be our base case for induction. So the base case, if a plus b is equal to 2, well, that means that a and b have to both be 1, right? I mean, these are integers we're talking about, and they got to be positive. But in that case, the GCD of 1 and 1 has to be 1. And so in that case then, well, the GCD of, say, um, you know, 1 times n and 1, uh, yeah, again, 1 times n again, yeah, you should be able to factor that n out. Uh, so GCD of these is, of course, going to be equal to the GCD of 1 and 1 times the absolute value of n. Okay, so the base case hopefully isn't too hard to believe. So what's the inductive hypothesis? Let's assume the result is true up to some point. So let's assume that A and B are arbitrary, and let's say that A is bigger than or equal to B. And so let's assume that uh, it's true for you know all sums of numbers, say um, Q and R, where uh, it's less than A plus B. So from the division algorithm, I know I get a Q and an R where A is equal to BQ plus R. And uh, in this case, R has to be strictly between B uh, and zero. And then what we'll do is we'll apply by our uh, Euclidean algorithm. And like, what do we get here? Well, I know that the GCD of A and B is gonna be the same as the GCD of B and R. Now what we'll do is we'll take our equation, A is equal to B times Q plus R, multiply that through by this number N, so everybody gets an n in this line here. Maybe I could use my highlighter, that makes sense. So everybody just got an n. And now we'll think about our GCD stuff again. Well, this says the GCD of a n and b n has to be the same thing as the GCD of b n and r n. Again, think about how you use the Euclidean algorithm. Now what we'll do is we'll look at the sum b plus r. So what is b plus r gonna be? Well, your expression for r, this is another way to think about r, right? If you solve that thing for r, that would give you this right here. Now what we'll do is we will just rewrite that a little bit differently. If you rewrite that, that's a minus b times some number q minus one. So what are you doing? You're taking stuff that's uh, you're taking stuff away from a, right? So that's uh, a minus some positive stuff ought to be less than or equal to a, and that should be less than if you added some stuff to b. So what did we just prove? Well, we just proved that b plus r is less than a plus r. So my inductive hypothesis, the statement is true it applies to b plus r. So by, induct, by our induction hypothesis, well, I should be able to factor out the GCD, uh, I should be able to factor this n out of the GCD of bn and rn. And so I can. So the result is true as long again as I'm less than a plus b. And so what do we have then? We just show that their GCDs are the same. So therefore, the GCD of br is the same thing as the GCD uh, of a and b. And that's kind of the proof of the lemma. Again, it's kind of a neat application of induction that um, isn't maybe as obvious as some of the induction proofs are in like a proofs class. Uh, another lemma that we'll need here, if you've got three integers, and if n divides a and it divides b, then n has to divide the greatest common divisor a of a and b as well. So in particular, this is kind of a nice proof. Just apply, what's the definition of what it means for n to divide both a and b? You get two integers where you get these two equations now. a is n times c1, b is equal to n times c2. And by the previous lemma, the GCD of a and b, if a is equal to nc1 and b is equal to nc2, this is the same thing as the GCD of these guys. And now factor that n out. So n times the GCD of c1 times c2. 
And so in particular, what do we get? I've got n times some integer is equal to the GCD of a, b. Therefore, n divides this number, and that's what this says. Maybe one of the more important results in this section is Euclid's theorem. What's it mean to be prime? So if p is a prime, and if a and b are two natural numbers, what it means to be prime is if p divides their product, a times b, then p has to divide one of the factors, p divides a or p divides b, or maybe p divides both. But it can't be possible that uh, p doesn't divide a or b. And again, you might think that this is kind of like, well, it's super duper obvious, right? And that's because we've been using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic our whole life. But maybe something where it's maybe not so obvious is, what if I wasn't in the integers? What if I looked at kind of the goofy ring, uh, z adjoin square to negative five, I think it was? And what we saw there is, you know, this unique factorization into a product of primes isn't necessarily unique. So somebody like six, six is an element of this. And remember, maybe this is the set of all things that look like a plus b times root negative five, where a and b are integers. So six is in there, right? a is six and b is zero. So yeah, it has that form. So six is equal to, okay, two times three. I'm telling you crazy stuff right now, but it's also equal to, well, one plus root negative five is in this ring and uh, one minus root negative five is in this ring as well. So I've got these two non-equivalent factorizations of six. And so what we're saying is, well, is two a prime in this set? Well, if two is prime, well then two, it divides this product, right? It divides six. If two is prime, then two has to divide both of these. And that's something that's not obvious. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. We might see later on how you look at that, or you might have seen in an algebra class how to look at that. But again, maybe the, the concept of what prime is, maybe we do take for granted that the integers are really nice, and maybe there's some more kind of uh, rings we need to proceed with more caution in. Anyway, though, Euclid's theorem. We'll prove this kind of, again, obvious results here, if you want to call it that. Well, if p divides a, then we're done. So let's suppose that p does not divide a. Well, uh, in particular, p is prime, so nothing divides both p and a besides one, right, since p is prime. So what we'll look at then is, well, what's the GCD of p times b and a times b? And by the previous result, we should be able to factor that b out. And again, well, if the GCD, so this should be equal to what's going on. This should be equal to b, factor that out, times the GCD of what's left, p and a, which we just said was one. So that's why it's just b right here. Hope that makes sense. Now, of course, p divides p times something else. And by hypothesis, p divides a times b, right? If you read the statement of the serum up here, if p divides a times b, okay, we'll use that right here. Well, then what we'll do is, well, p has to divide the GCD of pb and ab. Has to divide that. So what would that be? What we'll do is we'll factor b out again. There he is right there. And now we'll put it all together. Remember that that's one. And of course, this finally leads to the fact that uh, p divides b, which is what that says there. So what did we just prove? We just proved that uh, if p divides a times b, and if we assume that uh, p does not divide a, then we show that p has to divide b, has to.